Welcome, welcome to Scary Stories, the channel that tells you scary stories. Welcome to Scary Stories NYC. We've got an interesting and frightening show for you today, and I'm going to kick it off with an all new story we got just last week and adapted from the testimony of an eyewitness. It's a story that happened after a wild weekend, and it's called Back to Work Dog Man, as told to Peter Bernard. Dear Scary Stories, a while back, some of my old college buddies dropped into town to visit with me. I'm set to get married on the weekend after Valentine's this year, and they're not going to get to be in town then, so they sort of gave me an early bachelor's party. We started chilling on Friday evening, and we weren't done till around 3 a.m. Sunday night, or Monday morning. Needless to say, I was a little more than out of it when I had to get in my car and drive to work after the weekend. That's why, when I saw a dog man standing at the end of the road blocking my ability to leave, I thought I was seeing things. I slowed the car down and rubbed my eyes and looked again. It was still there. Now, what exactly am I saying was standing there? It looked like some kind of hairy devil man, to be honest. It was facing away from me, toward the direction I wanted to go. It was definitely a male. I could tell even from behind. It was covered in fur, which was dark, with flecks of lighter colors mixed in. The fur wasn't really long, but it was long enough to be blowing in the breeze a bit. It had a tail, so I know it was not a bear. It had a long tail that it was using to flick away bugs, more the way a cow uses its tail than a dog. It stood on its hind legs like a bear or a meerkat. I wondered what it was looking at. Then I remembered. It couldn't possibly be real. Frustrated, I beeped at the mythological creature and told it to get off the road if it was real and to blink out of existence if it wasn't. It chose to do neither. Instead, this thing turned around and gave me the scariest stink eye expression I'd ever seen from any species in my entire life. Once it was looking at me, I could see that it had a long snout and it bared its lips to demonstrate for me that it had teeth long enough to easily make me its breakfast. I found myself driving backward down the street, backing away from the monster as quickly as I could and not even looking behind me. The creature turned completely around and was walking toward me like an angry police officer about to give me a ticket. My heart was pumping harder than it ever has before, and I realized I was going to have to get past that thing somehow. There was no other exit to my block. The other side is a dead end. I backed up faster, watching behind me now. I had to get as much of a head start as possible, then just try to speed past the thing before it could grab me or stop me. I had the unnatural feeling that the thing was so strong that it could somehow stop my car or maybe punch through my driver's window or something terrible. I don't know if it were actually that strong, but this thing seemed like an evil troll from a fairy story, and I wouldn't have been surprised at anything it did. I don't think I would have been surprised if it sprouted wings and flew. So, I backed up all the way to the edge of the dead end, and the seven or eight foot tall bipedal thing kept angrily strutting toward me. He had this expression on his dog face like a parent about to give their kid a severe punishment. When the thing was about 200 feet away, I hit the gas pedal and started driving directly toward it. 
My plan was to try to scare it into jumping out of the way. And if it didn't, I would attempt to swerve around it and get free without crashing the vehicle and killing myself. My heart was pumping so hard that my hands were vibrating in rhythm with my blood. I wasn't sure if I was going to drive or faint. And then I noticed that creature had no intention of getting out of my way. I swerved to the right and he dove for my car. I heard and felt him bang hard into the side doors, but I just kept driving. I thought I was free of the monster, but as I made the left turn toward the highway entrance road, I cut it kind of close, and I felt the creature banging into the curb on the side of the road. In my rearview mirror, I saw the monster rolling into the bushes and out of my sight. So it had actually held onto one of the car door handles for more than half a block before I was able to shake the thing. Needless to say, I was too scared to go home that night, and I stayed over with my fiancé. It's been a couple of weeks and I haven't seen the thing again. I admit that, since then, I'm a little paranoid. My girlfriend won't stay here after dark anymore, although I pointed out to her that this all happened at 7 in the morning with the sun out. Hopefully, it was just a fluke. Maybe the dogman had a rough weekend too. Maybe he thought he was imagining me just like I thought I was hallucinating him. All I know is, I look both ways, up and down my block now, before leaving for work. And so far... I haven't seen any more back to work dog men. Do you have a scary story you want us to read on the show? Just call our voicemail hotline 804 Le Scary. That's 804 537 2279. And now for something completely scary. The robot of Staten Island has told to Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. Dear P.Q. River and Scary Stories, What I'm about to tell you is true, so help me God. It happened when me and this girl who we will call Gwen used to go driving around to parking lots to do some private hanging out. This was way back when I still lived with my parents, so it happened over two years ago at least. We had just been out at a bar celebrating my 30th birthday and decided to drive way out to Briel Avenue and the Green Belt area. It's over by the baseball fields and the soccer field. I mean the rectangular parking lot, not the circular one, you know. There were two other cars when we showed up. Both looked dark and empty, so we figured we'd have some privacy, and we pulled in, parking in the furthest corner right up by the trees. We got loose really fast and got down to some heavy petting when Gwen started complaining about something she was smelling, but I couldn't smell anything. Then we both started hearing a weird crackling or popping sound. It sounded like something from an old Frankenstein movie, like equipment that Igor and the doctor would use to bring the monster to life. What was the name of the doctor in those old Frankenstein pictures again? I can never remember his name. Anyway, if you don't know what I mean, watch any of the really old ones like Bride of Frankenstein or Young Frankenstein and you'll hear what I mean in the lab scenes. It's not the kind of sound you expect to hear coming from the forest in the green belt in Staten Island and it was interfering with my birthday celebration. Gwen told me to get out and see what it was, so I opened the door and stood there, shining my phone's flashlight at the trees, which really didn't help that much. We still couldn't see anything, but we could hear that it was definitely getting louder, and now we could hear something moving through the bushes, crackling branches getting closer and closer all the time. I got back in the car and told Gwen maybe we should go park in this other spot we liked over closer to New Dorp. She accused me of being chicken, which totally ruined the birthday mood, I have to say. We started arguing and then suddenly, crash, this freaking thing comes out of the trees and is making for the hood of my car. I'll describe it for you later, but in reality, I think I saw it for about a second in real time, maybe less than I started the car up as fast as I could. 
Gwen was still deeply wrapped up inside of throwing insults at me and was pushing my arm hard as I was trying to get the key in, causing me to miss the first time. Great, I thought, as the entire world slowed down to super slow motion. I'm gonna die because Gwen doesn't want to lose an argument about whether I'm a chicken or not. On my birthday, no less, this girl is going to get us both killed by a... By a what? The car started, and now I had to look behind to make sure I could pull back safely, so I had still not gotten to take a second look at whatever it was. While pulling the car backwards to get the hell out of there, the few images I caught of it flooded past my imagination over and over and over in a loop. What my memory was showing me was a robot, like a gray mechanical man from an old black and white science fiction movie, tearing out of the park at a ridiculous speed with its arms flailing about on either side of it. It was covered in branches, leaves, and dirt, and sparks flew off its jointed parts. One branch with leaves on it attached to its left shoulder was on fire. I had backed up as far as I needed to and was about to make a left turn and speed out of there when I finally had a chance to look ahead and see it again. It had a gray metallic cylindrical torso. It had arms that were jointed many times and moved like snakes or like Dr. Octopus arms, but there were only two and they were about the same as human length. The legs were the same way but thicker, and the feet seemed very large and heavy. The head had lights where the eyes should be, but no nose or mouth. I'm not kidding. It looked like it came out of lost in space, and it was now about half the distance from the forest, still headed for my car. I drove forward, swerving left, and clipped the robot as I was making the turn. I could hear my right front light crash, and I saw that I had only one working headlight now. The robot rolled down the length of my car on the right, completely denting the car's exterior from front to back and making Gwen scream so loud that I lost hearing in my right ear for a few seconds. I saw in the rearview mirror that the robot was still rolling down the road with sparks and branches flying everywhere. We drove over to Forest Avenue because I needed some White Castle chicken rings to calm down before I looked at the damage to my mother's car. All the while, this loudmouthed girl next to me was screaming something about White Castle not being vegan or something. I parked in the lot and went inside with her screaming what she wanted at me. I came back outside and got back in the car and she could see I didn't get her anything she asked me to get. After bellowing a few more horrible and uncalled-for things at me, she went inside to get her own food. As soon as the White Castle door was shut, I drove the hell out of there so I could eat my chicken rings in peace, you know what I'm saying? After calming down, I went on Facebook and found that my backup girlfriend on Stockton Street in Rahway was online, so I got her to invite me over and finished celebrating my birthday out there. She lives with her sister in a nice house near the water in that giant smokestack factory over there. It's a pretty place to live. But the next morning, I knew that I had to break the news to my mom that her car got smashed up the night before. No, I never told her anything about a robot because I knew she wouldn't believe me. I said that a motorcycle gang had tried to run me off the road. Anyway, she's almost paid off the repairs, and it's only a couple years later, so it's not like it was that big a deal, and she never gave me too much crap about it. It was my birthday, after all. I never saw Gwen again, which is fine with me, but because of that, I've never actually told anybody this story before. I did an internet search about robots in Staten Island, but found nothing, so I don't know if anyone found it the next morning or ever saw anything like it again. I still don't know what we even saw, so I'm not sure how to search for more info about it. Was it a robot from space or another reality? Was it a person in a costume? Was it a prank? How and why was it sparkling like that? Why was it in a forest? Then why did it run at my car? Why did it have lights where the eyes should go like something made to scare Dr. Smith and Will Robinson? How could that be a functional thing to have lights where the eyes were? The entire construction of the thing was ridiculous. It wasn't something that could have possibly been there. And yet, you can ask my mother if it wasn't there because she spent the last two years paying to fix the damage that robot caused. 
Well, actually, don't ask her, since she thinks it was a motorcycle gang, but you get my point. Whatever that thing was that night, it was most definitely real. It was absolutely not just something I imagined, and it was something I hope to never see again. I'd like to take a moment to say that if you have a scary story you'd like to tell us here, you can write Peter at PeterBernard.com or you can call our new Scary Stories hotline number and leave it to us in the form of a voicemail message. It's easy to remember. 804-LE-SCARY. That's 804-L-E-S-C-A-R-Y or... 804-537-2279. Pencil Thin, as told to Peter Bernard, read by Madeline Starr. My main boyfriend in high school used to love forcing me to watch horror movies. I always made fun of the girls in the films who would get all dressed up to get chased by a monster or maniac. He, on the other hand, would complain if the girls dressed boringly for their own gruesome murder. He saw it all as showbiz, but back then I thought those young women characters were idiotic and insulting. It's weird that I didn't get angry at the monsters trying to kill them as much as I got angry at the victim characters themselves. If you're facing unspeakable horror, I reasoned, at least have the intelligence to wear good running shoes. He and I broke up a few weeks before I went away to a prestigious college to study art. As a result, when I got asked out on dates in freshman year, I said yes to everyone, especially if it was an invite to a party. I wanted to meet as many new people as I could, and at the time, I was most interested in meeting boys. I ended up seeing three different boys at the same time. (laughs) None of them seriously, but all of them regularly. We were more friends than anything else. To be honest, I had never gotten serious with anyone yet, even though at the time I would have told you differently. I thought I knew what love was, but there had never been a guy who made me lose control. There had never been a guy who got me nervous or made me stutter. Not until I met Rick, that is. Rick was a senior. He was a football player. He had a rich daddy. He was a frat boy. He was everything that all the guys I had ever known were not. When he came over to talk to me while I was eating lunch with two of the freshmen who had crushes on me, I was so surprised I could hardly speak. I remember getting only one word out, which was, sure, when he asked me to a big senior dance. After he left, the two boys whose names I didn't even know both mocked how I said the word. They both joked like they were in love and blew kisses at each other. We have a different name for Rick, one of them mentioned to me. Yeah, it rhymes with Rick, but starts with a different letter, the other boy chimed in. Such children. I didn't have to date children anymore. I was going to a big dance with a senior. Needless to say, I got turned out for the event. I bought new heels, really my first very tall shoes. And I got an off-the-shoulder top that matched perfectly with a vintage pencil skirt I found at a local thrift shop. I wanted to go flirty, but not slutty. I was certain I had everything all thought out. My roommate in my dorm insisted on giving me walking lessons in the new shoes, and little did I know it at the time, but she may have saved my life. Rick picked me up in a red Mazda convertible that must have cost his daddy a pretty penny. He made a big fuss over my outfit as I walked out to the car. Feeling daring, I gave him a kiss on the cheek. He chuckled and we went off. At the party, we hung with his buddies on the football team, none of whom talked to me beyond saying hello, and their dates, none of whom were very nice to me either. At one point in the ladies' room, one of the football girlfriends made a snide remark about how Rick's dates keep getting younger and younger. I was surprised he didn't have a steady girlfriend. I told them, and they all suppressed laughs. <laughs> Rick? Rick is not the going steady kind of guy, I was told. Which I have to admit really bummed me out. Still, these girls were clearly jealous and spiteful, so 
I resolved to hear them out but not take what they said at face value. Well, I told them, maybe he just hasn't met the right girl before. They all laughed at me but not as nastily as before. You are a sweet girl, a large redhead told me. Why don't you talk to Marco who is throwing this party about getting a ride home? I know he's got a designated driver hanging out somewhere so he can get you home safe. I eyed the redhead suspiciously. Are you trying to say I'm not safe? I asked her through glaring eyes. I only said you're a sweet girl. She answered while touching the tip of my nose with the extra long fingernail of her index finger. I hope you can stay that way. Talk to Marco. She turned on her heels and left, two of her friends exiting with her. My head was spinning. If those girls were lying, then I could be losing out on a great guy. If they were telling the truth, though, they could be saving me from a very bad situation. How could I give Rick a fair chance to prove them wrong without putting myself at risk? I decided to act like nothing had happened, but still keep myself on guard for warning signs. When I got back outside, Rick handed me a drink. But I hadn't seen him pour it, and I didn't really know what was in it, so I put the drink down and led him out to the dance area instead. Finally, I had his full attention, and we both seemed to be really enjoying ourselves. Afterward, Rick involved me in the banter with his friends, finally, and I was really warming up to him. The conversation itself was boring, mainly about how I should loosen up and have a drink. Finally, I said I would have a beer if he would teach me how to use the keg pump thing. It looked like fun, and that way, I'd be able to pour the drink myself. I was relieved when this solution seemed to please him. We went back to having fun. Rick thought I had downed four beers, but I had probably only had the equivalent of one or two, since I had been dumping most of the drinks in the potted plants around the party. Speaking of potted, I still felt certain that I was in control of myself and ready for anything that might happen. Rick's buddy started pairing off with girls and leaving the party, and soon, I was back in his convertible heading off into darkness with him. So far, so good. We joked around and flirted as he drove until we hit a very dark road heading through a local wooded area. There was forest on both sides, set about 15 or 20 feet back off the road. Suddenly, Rick slowed the car down, pulled off the side and stopped. Whoops, looks like the engine broke down, Rick said sarcastically. I giggled nervously. Rick, <laughs> that's not funny. This place is kind of creepy. Did I say the engine broke down? I meant we're out of gas. He crooned in my ear, then went in for a kiss. I kissed him back. Something inside said I shouldn't, yet at that moment it just felt like I was born to kiss this boy. It all felt so right. Then we kissed longer and I started to get uncomfortable. He was getting very forceful, and when I would pull back, he wasn't getting the hint. He started to grab parts of my body that no boy should grab before at least the third date, not even a senior. I took his hands off me as gently as I could, looked him in the eye, and spoke. Rick, honey, you're a special guy, but this is our first date, and... I won't repeat what he said to me then, but he said it angrily. I felt embarrassed and humiliated because his words revealed that he had no respect for me at all. After informing me that I had failed the test for a possible second date, he leaped out of the car, walked around the front, tore my door open, and pulled me out, throwing me on a patch of gravel on the side of the road. I now hurt all over and began to weep openly. Stop crying, he bellowed as he got back in his car. This is the patch of forest right behind your dorm, you idiot. You're five minutes away from home, moron. Just walk through those trees. Suddenly furious, I got to my feet and screamed at him to take me home. But he just drove off laughing. I stood there crying and in shock for some time. I have no idea how long. A part of me told me I better get started toward the dorm, but another part of me questioned whether Rick was telling the truth about that part of it. I took out my cell phone and shone the flashlight app at the woods, 
squinting to see if I could see anything at all inside or beyond the trees. All I could see, though, were trees. I turned the flashlight app off, and... What was that? Did I see something move in the woods to the left just before I turned the light off? Or was it that I just moved the phone and that changed the angle of the light, making shadows move? I suppose that I should turn the light on again and check, but... But but what if it was something really there? I, I might be better off just not knowing. I suddenly realized I was living out one of my high school boyfriend's favorite horror movies. Only now I was one of the stupid girls I had always made fun of. How had that happened? It was because of hormones. It was hormones that made me stupid enough to cast myself in this horror movie. I had always done everything right. I had always been a perfect girl and then a perfect young lady. I would let my guard down only once and... Wait a second. I really hadn't let my guard down at all. This, this was not my fault. I was mistreated by a jerk who tricked me into going on a date with him. If I was guilty of anything, it was of being too impressed with the glamour of dating a senior and a football player. Who could I even call to come get me here? I wouldn't even know where to tell them I was. Maybe I could figure it out with GPS? I was never good with maps. Anyone I could think of to call would spread the story around the school faster than I figured Rick was already spreading it. I felt sorry for myself and started crying again. Then I heard a snap behind me across the road. Without hesitation, I had the phone's flashlight app on, scanning the tree line. Nothing. Then, something. Something white moving among the trees. White and thin. What was that? A deer? Maybe an albino deer? Then I saw part of it move between the trees much higher than I had noticed it before. Was it climbing the trees? Well then, what was the thin white thing below it? Were there more than one of it? Then came a rustle of leaves at every height, and a thing walked out from the trees out into the open. It was very, very tall, very, very white. I could see no face on it. I could only see a stick body, like a puppet of a man made of white sticks. It had to be seven feet tall. No, really, it must have been taller than that. It was an impossible thing. It stood there, seeming to stare at me. And I just did the same back. Rather than contemplate the impossibility of this thing and the situation, rather than fainting and falling into shock, what was going on through my mind was whether I could run on gravel faster barefoot or in these dancing shoes. Casually not taking my eyes off the thing, I removed one shoe and stepped backwards. I landed on top of a sharp rock, which really hurt, and I left out a soft whimper. At that sound, the stick man charged directly at me. I put the shoe back on and limping and mincing, made my way into the forest as fast as I could, which was not fast. I was screaming for help. Once in the forest, I could hear the thing tearing through the brush behind me and I realized I was going to die. There was no way I could outrun it, even if I had remembered to wear comfortable running shoes to my own murder. All that was left now was to find out how innovative and interesting my killing would be. Would the special effects be interesting or fake looking? Would the audience laugh at my death? Would they be grossed out by it? These thoughts made me feel insane. I dropped to the ground and lay there, waiting to die. I heard the thing stop behind me after I fell. It was reaching out and touching things around it, but not moving forward after me any longer. I began to wonder if it had any eyes or ability to see. Maybe it was chasing the sound of me. Maybe it stopped because I stopped making noise. I could see it right there, only 20 feet away, behind some trees. Before you can understand why I did the next thing I did, you have to understand that I really thought I was done for and had nothing to lose. I shone my phone's flashlight on its face. It didn't react at all, it had no ability to see. 
Next, I did something I had actually learned from my ex-boyfriend's horror movies. I found a rock of a size I thought I could throw for a long distance. As silently as I could, I picked it up, picked myself up, and heaved that rock over the stick monster and nearly back out onto the road. The thing tore backwards, away from me, loudly shoving bushes and trees aside to get to what made the noise. Using the monster's noise as a cover, I ran as fast as I could away from it in the direction Rick had indicated my dorm was. I never looked behind me, and I was making so much noise racing through the undergrowth and trees that I had no idea if the thing was behind me or not. I finally got to a clearing, and amazingly, Rick had been telling the truth, and I really was another hundred yards away from my dorm. Now, I looked behind me as I rummaged through my purse for my keys. I couldn't see anything chasing me, but I kept my eyes on the forest and walked backwards toward the dorm. Of course, I tripped and was about to fall on my behind yet again when something caught me. I screamed. But it was human arms holding me. I looked up and it was one of those kids from lunch, the one who had said rude things about Rick. Oh, wow. You look gorgeous. He stammered like a puppy dog in love. Well, except for all the scratches and twigs in your hair, I mean, but other than that, wow. Inside, I stammered to the kid. We need, we need to get inside. I'm sure it hurt us. The stick man is going to kill us. Um, okay, he replied sarcastically. What did that idiot put in your drink tonight? But then the crashing sound in the woods came back. It was getting louder. It had heard me scream. Staring in shock at the forest for only a second or two, this boy picked me up, picked me up for real, and he literally carried me back to the dorm. Inside, we both peered out the small glass window in the door, trying to catch a glimpse of what was coming for us from the forest, but it never emerged from the tree line. I looked this kid over. He didn't look strong enough to have done what he just did. I mean, I'm a small girl, but still weigh nearly a hundred pounds. When some people get scared, they fall apart. Other people find hidden reserves of strength. Hey kid, I nudged him on the shoulder. What's your name anyway? His name, as it turned out, was Jerry. I claimed him as my boyfriend, but only for as long as it took to make him my husband. These days we live in Manhattan and co-own a posh art gallery. We stay as far away from lonely forest roads as we can. Even all these years later, he still stammers like a lovesick puppy dog when I get dressed up. But these days, I wear my pencil skirts with a slit in the back. And I keep sneakers in my purse, just in case I need to run for my life. Up next, aliens stole my breakfast cereal. In the description of this video, we've got a link to our new Scary Stories t-shirt. It's our classic skull logo, and it says Scary Stories underneath in the Kaiju Monster font. It comes in black, and also black, and other dark colors, such as black. Good for ladies or gentlemen, hoodies too, whatever you need. Aliens stole my breakfast cereal. As told to Peter Bernard, read by P.Q. River. Dear Peter Bernard, I'm writing to submit this story to be read on your Scary Stories YouTube show. I am not an out-of-the-ordinary person, yet I had an out-of-the-ordinary thing happen to me, and I swear to you it's all true. I was 24 years old at the time. I won't tell you how far back this occurred, because I do not want to give out my age or too many details about myself. I have a respectable job and don't want my co-workers connecting me with this story in any way. I remember that I was 24 because I had just moved into the Pennsylvania home I still reside in. I had inherited it from a relative that I was close with, and I had spent much time in that house as a kid, so in a way, it was like moving back home. Each weekday, I have to drive in to a local town, park my car, then take the rail into the city to work, 
but having a completely paid-for home in a quiet suburban neighborhood surrounded by family and friends was, and is, worth the extra travel time for me. My deceased relative never told me about any ghosts or other weirdness in or around the house, so I had no expectations of anything strange occurring. Yet, one Saturday morning, just after dawn, an object which I can really only describe as a flying saucer landed in my backyard. It was exactly what you're visualizing, a silver, circular flying saucer glinting in the early light of the morning sun, descending out of the sky and landing on my lawn as I watched it out of my kitchen window. It was as though it had waited for me to get up before coming down. I walked out of the house's back door, which is in my kitchen, and stood on the top step of the three-step concrete step stairway leading down to the yard. For some reason, I wasn't afraid of the thing. I just stood there, watching it. The people that got out are not what you're probably expecting. They wore these sort of diving suits, colored kind of a grayish-purple color that reflected back pink, I guess you might say. They were also shorter than me, I'd guess maybe about four feet tall, since I'm about five foot seven. Their heads were not larger than ours, though. In fact, I thought their heads looked tiny, even on their smaller bodies. Their faces looked human. They looked like two Caucasian men in their 30s or 40s. One of them had dark hair with a beard. The other had sandy brown hair with gray on the sides. Their faces and bodies both looked human, but like I said, they were short and their heads were far too small for their bodies. Something about them terrified me and made me feel like I was going to be sick. On the other hand, these same qualities made me laugh out loud in their faces. I mean, their heads were just so small, so impossibly small. They both came over to me, smiling, and I was frozen in fear. I felt as though I was about to die. These two hideous, tiny head things were going to kill me while I just stood there, unable to move. They walked closer, grinning like total idiots. Then they took turns hugging me. After hugging me, both of them stood there, smiling, staring at the screen door leading back into my kitchen. After a moment, I realized they were asking to be invited in, so not wanting to be rude, I let the two smiling, tiny head men into my house, following after them. Before I had even entered my kitchen, though, one of them had grabbed my box of corn puffs out of my cabinet, and both of them almost knocked me down, exiting back through the same screen door they had come in through, still smiling as broadly as their minuscule heads would allow. I regained my balance, then watched out through the screening as they ran into the flying saucer and took off wildly, almost grazing my neighbor's roof in their rush to get away with their crime. The silliest part of it is that I had an unopened box of corn puffs in the pantry that I would have gladly given them as a gift if I'd known they wanted it. The box they got away with was already more than half eaten. Since then... When I buy corn puffs, I only eat the boxes halfway, then leave the rest of the box on my back steps for the flying saucer men. So far, nobody has come to claim them, so I usually throw them out the next morning if they're still there. I'm not really certain, but I get the feeling that to those strange men, the corn puffs taste better if you acquire them dishonestly. I felt sorry for myself because I had no doorman. But then I met a man who had no scary stories, Psychic Bigfoot vs. Savage Bigfoot paraphernalia. Did you know you could be wearing a Psychic Bigfoot vs. Savage Bigfoot t-shirt right now? They come in white, black colors, long sleeve, short sleeve, little baby red sleeve, wife beater size, wife size, pregnant wife size. Plus, you can own a scary story, Psychic Bigfoot vs. Savage Bigfoot hat, hoodie, journal, postcards, wall decals. All this can be yours right now by going to cafepress.com slash scary stories. Stories NYC. Link is in the description. The Shovel is told to Peter Bernard, read by PQ River. Dear Scary Stories, I have a story that you might or might not want to read because I don't think it's paranormal or about a cryptid or anything, but when it happened to me, it certainly was scary. The fact is, this is the scariest thing that ever happened to me. 
Okay, uh, first I have to explain the boring details of my life back then so you'll have some context to understand this story. And when this happened about eight years ago, I was 27 years old and the young lady I wanted to marry just dumped me for my boss. I couldn't deal with it and quit my job, so I sort of felt like I had lost everything and was indulging in a lot of self-pity. When I wasn't feeling sorry for myself, I was so numbed out that I wasn't feeling much of anything at all. Both my parents were dead, I was an only child, and I was 27, an age where suicide seems romantic. I was in a bad daze, and I needed to get my act together so I could get a new job and start a new life before the rent got overdue. I resolved to take a me day, the way my now ex-girlfriend had always done when she wanted to regroup. I wondered how many of those her days were really her cheating with my boss days, and stopped myself. For the next 24 hours, I was giving myself permission to not think at all about the things I was upset about. I decided to go to Penn Station and get a round-trip ticket to the end of the line on one of the trains I'd never been on before. Then, while riding the unfamiliar train, I'd look out the window and get off at whichever town I felt like, certain that at least nothing there would come attached with memories of her. I can't remember what line I got the tickets on or the name of the station I got off at, but I do remember it was a warm early autumn day really lovely out. Spent about 90 minutes wandering around looking in the shops. I skipped past the Starbucks and had lunch at a local non-chain restaurant instead, intending to do the things I could never do in the city. I was really looking forward to some non-mass manufactured tasting home-cooked food, but it turned out everything tasted like it came out of a can. It probably did. If Rod Serling were still alive, he might be writing those kinds of twist endings by the 21st century. Man yearns for his childhood. Somehow through the twilight zone he achieves his dream and returns to his past. Then he realizes with horror that his mom's recipes were actually made out of Libby's canned vegetables and spam. Plus, there's no cell phone reception or YouTube. Thinking thoughts like this made me feel lighter, and I also had run out of things to do in the town, so I started to look up and notice the tall, tree-covered mountains looming over the town in one direction. It had just sort of seemed like a pretty painted backdrop until I stopped to notice it. There were miles and miles of mountains. It looked like it could sustain life for a family of Bigfoot and a tribe of hillbillies. I imagined what it must be like in there and felt jealous of wild animals that get to live in places like that. When you're feeling sorry for yourself, you even start getting jealous of rats and vermin. Nobody has it as bad as you do. I wasn't equipped to go hiking or camping, but I wondered if I might be able to wander a bit through the outskirts of the forest and chillax for a while before catching an early evening train back to reality. I had no idea if it was open to the public or restricted or how any of that would work, so I just wandered in the direction of the mountains. After about 10 or 15 minutes, the posh neighborhoods and shops gave way to a more factory-looking neighborhood, with large, block-long, four-story tall brick buildings, absolutely nobody out walking on the old cobblestone streets. On the other side of these buildings, which I began to assume were abandoned, was another street and a wall. When I reached it, I saw that the wall was about four feet tall and seemed to separate the factory neighborhood from a forest. A little trickle of a stream flowed by immediately in front of me. I looked to my right, then on my left, I noticed a bridge off in the distance which looked like it led over to the other side of the stream. Before I had reached the bridge, I noticed that the stream must have been much larger in the past, more like a river, really. The bridge was far too large for such a tiny stream, and the water ran down the center of a deep, wide depression that obviously had been filled with water in the past. The whole air of abandonment was so different from the warm and quaint feel of the town that I was beginning to wonder if I should just turn back now and not bother visiting the forest. To be honest, I was starting to feel a little creeped out by the whole ghost town vibe. When I reached the other side, I saw the remnants of an old dock, which confirmed my suspicions that this had once been a river. 
I guess that this river is why the town had come into existence, and it must have originated with those factories built on the river. Everything was decrepit and falling down and had graffiti covering it that itself looked like it might be older than me. Even as a teen hangout or lover's lane, this place was a ghost town. I was about to walk back when I happened to glance at the forest beyond the end of the man-made falling down structures. It was entrancing, like a woman that wants you to pay her some attention. On that day, I was not going to be able to resist her. So off into the woods I went. Wandering slowly among the trees, the air got cleaner and cleaner. It was markedly different than the kind of air I am used to in Manhattan. I turned around to find a landmark to keep my sense of direction and spotted a tall water tower near the train station. Walking backwards, I made mental notes of which side of the tower I was observing and how the trees were situated around it. I turned back around and nearly bumped into him. He stood much taller than me, as I could be certain of, since my forward-looking eyes were looking at his massive, muscular chest, covered by a thin old t-shirt with the Coca-Cola logo on it. I gasped and took a step backwards, mumbling, excuse me, as I craned my neck up to try to see his face, which was not looking at me, but at the town. I staggered backwards some more, and his face was now backlit by the setting sun, which burned my eyes. He was wearing jeans, his head was bald, he was giant, and he was holding the largest shovel I've ever seen. I'm sorry, I stammered. I wasn't watching where I was going. He continued, staring at the town. I'll just be, I'll be, well, it's time for my train. Bye. I walked away quickly muttering under my breath that I was talking to myself. Then I heard a noise behind me, turned to see that he was running at me, holding the shovel in front of him. Hey, what? No! I stammered and then realized I'd better run. Maybe he'd leave me alone if i just beat it back to town. I made it over the bridge and passed the wall and was out of breath. I stopped for a second to look behind me and just missed getting smashed in the face by the shovel, which jammed into some metal fencing and got stuck. The giant man worked at getting the shovel released, and I could see it would come free in another try or two, so I turned and ran. I've never run like that before or since. I was more out of breath than I've ever been, yet somehow my legs kept moving anyway. I was four blocks into the factory neighborhood before I even looked back. I shouldn't have, since he was gaining on me again. I was going to have to find a place to hide because I couldn't run like this any longer. I made a right at the next block and ducked down behind some piled-up garbage from another generation. A rat was there that I literally grabbed by the tail and threw down the street. When you're afraid of dying, your priorities completely change. Normally, you couldn't pay me to touch a street rat, but on that day, I didn't even think twice about it. I lay on my back, panting, unable to disguise my heavy breathing until I had caught my breath. I prayed for air and I prayed no rat would run out on top of me and give away my location to the shovel man. After a while, it occurred to me that I had never heard him run by. When I had caught my breath and started to feel human again, I slowly raised my head past the garbage. The shovel came down hard, but mostly missed me, scraping my cheek and ear and causing me a bit of pain. I screamed and leaped at the man, and we both tumbled onto the street. He fell on his back, and I ran over him toward the town of Little Shops, now only a block away. I screamed help one time, then realizing that screaming took too much air from running, I didn't have to look behind me. I knew the Coca-Cola t-shirt would be close behind, but would he come into the civilized part of the town? I ran through the streets, and people were staring at me with unhappy expressions for doing so. I took that as a good sign since they weren't staring behind me in horror. I ducked into Starbucks and ran into the men's room, collapsing in a stall and feeling safe in the arms of corporate capitalist branding. The noises and screams that suddenly came from the store told me that feeling safe here was wrong. A huge crash followed by more screaming said he had smashed the entire storefront window. 
I reasoned that if I were ever going to be able to get out of there, it would be while there were panic outside. So I exited the bathroom and turned the opposite way from the front of the store, hoping there might be a rear exit, as many of these suburban stores have. Sure enough, there was a back door that emptied into a parking lot, and just beyond it was the train station. My train station. My escape from this lunatic who seemed bent on killing me. It felt like I was flying toward the station through the parking lot. Then a heavy pain started in my chest, and I realized I was taxing my limits and needed to focus. Breathe. Run. Breathe. Run. You can only go as fast as you can go. Slow and steady wins the race. Do, do I have my return ticket? Yes, it's in my left pocket. No, in my right pocket. When is the train? I raced into the ticket office area and asked the guy panting when the next train was. Booth man started telling me to calm down, and I grew panicky. I looked behind me. Captain Coca-Cola had exited the Starbucks the same way I had and was headed in this direction. Please, for the love of God, when is the next train to the city? I begged him. Well, sir, if you're going to take the Lord's name in vain, then... I saw paper schedules on the side and grabbed one. Racing up the stairs to the platform, I didn't hear the rest of what the booth man said. As I reached the top of the stairs, I could hear the shovel destroying the glass doors to the ticket booth area. I shoved the schedule in my pocket and looked around. I was the only person on the platform. The station was mostly open air, but this center part had a covering over it, held up by poles here and there. I shimmied up one of the poles and climbed onto the roof. Maybe I would be safe waiting for the train up here. I could hear terrible noises of destruction and someone was screaming in pain. I hoped it was the shovel man. I hoped I would never see him again and be able to get out of here. No such luck. There he was, coming up the stairs now. Clomp, clomp, clomp. The huge man climbed the staircase. Had he seen me when I saw him? I ducked down, laid back on the roof, and as quietly as possible, pulled the schedule out of my pocket to see when the next train was due in. According to what I was reading, and what my watch said, the train should be there right then. I looked down the track and saw nothing, though. I was hoping it hadn't come already. And then my thoughts turned back to Shovel Man as I heard him walking below. He went past me, down to the edge of the platform, and looked around to see if I was hiding down on the tracks or past the end of the station. Then he walked back to directly underneath where I was hiding, and I heard a strange but familiar sound. What was that? It was like a dog sound. I suddenly realized the shovel man was sniffing the air underneath me. If he could smell like a dog, he'd be able to smell my fear and tell I was up there. I decided to stand up as quietly as I could and try to get down to the other end of the roof, but it was too late. Bang! Something had struck the pole underneath me hard, and the entire covering of the station trembled and rocked underneath. Bang! This one knocked me off my balance, and I fell right off the edge of the covering. As I fell, it seemed like time slowed down to a crawl. I think I thought I was going to die because I saw everything I had ever done like it was happening then. I saw past and present as part of one thing. I saw a shovel man as a force of nature to be accepted. I saw the pavement of the station coming up fast at my face, and I saw a train heading toward the station. A train heading towards the station. Instincts I didn't know had kicked in, and I somehow landed in such a way as to only cause extreme pain, but no lasting or debilitating injuries. I was about nine or ten feet from the man, which meant maybe two feet from the reach of his shovel. I screamed and ran directly at the man, which caused his eyes to open wide and his face to make the strangest surprised expression I'll ever see. His surprise allowed me to run right past him and down to the advertising and benches further down the platform. He turned around and raced after me. I turned the corner more sharply than I knew he could, and then started racing back the way I came from. 
The train was almost entering the station. I thought I was keeping him at a safe distance, but the shovel man landed a hit square on my back with the flat of his shovel and had all the wind knocked out of me. I turned on my back in pain, trying to start breathing again as I saw the huge man walk over me, looking down at me expressionlessly. He raised his shovel far over his head and prepared to end my life. I kicked up crazily with both feet as hard as I could. I think I got him with my left foot and on his left hip with my right foot, which closed his eyes in pain and sent him sideways a bit just as the train pulled past us fast. The corner of the first car clipped him on the side of his head. I saw the blood fly one way and the man fly another. I would like to say I ran heroically toward the back of the train, but actually it took me a while even to stand, and when I first started moving it was more of a combination crawl and stagger. Eventually I was limping, which was an improvement. The train pulled to a halt. Then I looked behind me. Mr. Man Mountain was standing again at full height, and the blood was streaming down the side of his face. He slammed the shovel into one of the train's windows, smashing it. A conductor leaned out and cursed at him to stop, so the giant took a swing at the conductor's head, narrowly missing. I realized I had opened into a sprint, yet somehow the man seemed to be gaining on me. My lungs, legs, and body ached for me to go into one of these cars and sit down, but I kept going, running, running to the final car. The bells rang, signaling that the doors were about to close. I dove into the final car, and the man ran past the door. Then he doubled back as the door shut, managing to get one arm inside the door. He turned and signaled to the motorman to open the door and let him in. But there was no motorman looking, and the train began moving. Coke man began howling something indecipherable and walking with the train as we headed down the track. Then he had to jog, then run. He tried to get in, he tried to get his arm out, Neither worked. Meanwhile, we were gaining speed, and he was tripping and unable to run fast enough to keep up. As we exited the station, his face and chest slammed into a pole at the front of the station at what must have been at least 30 miles an hour, and he was flung free of the door with a noise that combined a snap with a crack and a gurgle. I watched out the back window as we pulled further and further away, and I never saw him get up. That didn't ease my paranoia any, though, so I watched outside the windows on both sides as we pulled into each station, genuinely expecting to see him there with his ridiculously large shovel waiting to kill me. I reasoned to myself that I just saw him get his arm snapped and his face dented, but the rest of the ride home was hell anyway. Finally, when I got back to Penn Station, it dawned on me that I really had escaped and I started weeping silently in my seat, continuing as I walked among the crowd. Normally people bumping into me annoyed me, but this time it meant I was safe and I was home. I walked through the city, which looked different to me now. Just as dirty, sure, just as crap encrusted, just as slimy and dusty and decrepit, but a different kind of dirty, crap-encrusted, slimy, dusty, and decrepit. And whereas when I left, everything seemed sterile and pointless, now these same streets symbolized potential impossibilities for me. I felt back in my element. I may not have the life I want, but at least I have my life, I said out loud, and a woman looked at me funny as she walked past. There are lots of chances you can take and lots of adventures you can have that don't require you to go on the turf of crazy homicidal maniacs. You can stay on your own turf for your entire safe life and engage in intellectual adventures. This is what I learned from my near-death experiences on that day. Just stay on your own turf and you'll be safe. And there it was, the double-wide double-door entrance to my apartment building. I was safe at home both literally and figuratively, and I felt lighter than air. And then I saw it, just laying there. Couldn't be. Yes, it could. It was a shovel. No, it was the shovel. The shovel was laying on the sidewalk in front of my apartment building. And so, I knew that this story was not over. The End 
。